What can men do that women can't? Pee standing up. <laughs> Bench press 150 k's, but I bet you there's somebody out there that can. If you've got instructions, you can do everything. Like, never understand people who can't change women, who can't change tires. I do, or never change a tire, because it's not something I like to do. What do you true. mean it's not true? Well, if you stand there and go like that, you can do it, can't you? Who? Oh, us. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, if it's a dirty lavatory, you can, yes. to the man in my life. He does all my jobs for me. Does my ironing. Does my vacuuming. What else do you do? I can't take you to bed. You're a bit hard. Oh, I don't know. What do we need men for? <laughs> I think women need men and men need women. And it's just a two-way thing. Oh, I couldn't live without them. They're terribly good at a lot of things, including some things I like very much. He cops for me. He helps me look after my daughter. And, um, well, behind closed doors. I've had some delicious men. <laughs> um, I like the, uh, the sense of strength. from a cordless telephone, the best thing that a rural woman can have is a supportive rural man. They have an extra sort of fixing chromosome and if there's a man, I'll get them to do it or change a tire or something. Makes sense to me. Probably nothing. Comfort. <laughs> Not a cold night. I remember that the household all revolves around Dad. We like when I was in the 60s, and so you know, dad comes home, and it's like, Sh, your father's here, and he's turning on the news, and he's tiptoeing around him because you know, the television's glued to the corner of the lounge and it never moves, you know, for 30 years. The married women, it was a disgrace, they don't get, didn't go out and work or leave home or anything like that. I gave up my career to help my husband's career, and I never regretted it. It's so pathetic giving up so many aspects of your life to mm. get someone else to take care of them for you. Mm. Well, you've got to take control of your own life. I didn't say it was right the way it was before, but there was a certain sense of security. The woman was supposed to turn it up so the man would give housekeeping money, but I suspect they did it increasingly grudgingly. If you, like, if your Surely. husband was called Bubba and had no teeth and forced you to stay at home, then there may be of our generation, I hate all that stuff, but if you're at home, then normally they've chosen to be there. When I get married, I expect to look after the kids <laughs> equally as much as I'm going to as well. So whether I'll have a hard time finding a guy like that, I'm not too sure, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna get married, yeah, yeah. I'm quite a traditional girl. <laughs> With any luck, or with someone, you know, taking care of the children or something like that, you know, I'd love to have a wife. <laughs> we want it both ways, you know? We want um, him to just to shut up and do what I say because, believe me, it'll be a lot easier if he just did it, you know? <laughs> and then, um, then, but then we also have got uh, women who are vulnerable and they are, have insecurities and vulnerabilities and we do want somebody to put their big arms around us and say it's going to be okay. <laughs> I didn't learn to be a shearer just to, to prove that women can do anything. I went out there to earn the money. Um, I never really thought much of it that I was going into an industry that was male dominant. I loved the flying, but what made me really want to be a pilot was the, was the, fit, the attitude from the instructors and the other pilots and the people in the industry that 
fine, you could fly for a hobby, but don't think of making it a career. I, I, <laughs> I'm just doing what I want to do. Only once one guy came into the shop and said to me, prove to me that you can sell me a chainsaw. And I thought, oh, well, you can go away. I need to talk to people like that. I know in my own family, I came from this huge patriarchy, five brothers and a father. The boys were instinctively bred to feel superior. And I think it's a bit of a shock to them when they realise that they're actually... For guys, because I mean, maybe we grew up with the story. And in some profession, and in a job, whatever, is like an insurance policy as well. There's always something to fall back on. Well, let's hope the ladies don't get any higher above the men. <laughs> uh, they are you. losing <laughs> so much in life, the women. Yeah, I think we've come far enough with the equality, don't you think so? A lot of my couple friends, the women are earning much more than the men. And they're handling all the house, and they're giving birth, and they're juggling it all. They seem to be, you know, still handling more than the blokes. So um, I'm not surprised that men are sort of needing to go off and see, <laughs> see the counsellors more often. <laughs> as women, as a species, were climbing that ladder, whatever, nobody wanted to know about, oh, Ian, by the way, it's really hard, and I don't know if this is working. It was like, shh, quick, we're getting somewhere, you know? We've just fought really hard to work harder. I mean, you know, do we have a better life now? My mother talks about playing tennis and getting together with her friends and, and art classes and different projects, you know, and, and I'm fighting to have a holiday. With us, there are a lot of working people in the house, but we're still, we're still not financially stable. I chose to be a full-time mother and carer for the first eight or nine years of the, these children's lives. But I also am uh, thrilled that I live in a country where you can then get on and whether it's a, um, a commercial career, or a, a community career, or a political career, that there aren't any impediments that stop women. There must be some jobs that maybe women are just too smart to, <laughs> to do, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> like how, many, how many women do you see working on... Oh, maybe they... And I'm sure they'd probably like a bit more attention, but I mean, I'm too busy to notice. <laughs> you know, most women are. Big tits. <laughs> Blowjobs. <laughs> well, oh, no, no. <laughs> but they'll moan they never get enough. Yeah, but I'll tell you what, we've got this one thing. Whoever had sex last night is supposed to supply the biscuits for half an hour. We don't get biscuits very often. The most intelligent men just want intelligent women, I'd hope, and I'd think. I know. Stimulation in, in every way, mm. you know? <laughs> lots of stimulation, lots of stimulation. Stimulation! Yeah. <laughs> Dave? Yeah. What, what do you want from women? <laughs> they don't know what they want. Men don't know what they want from women. Men can only think about one thing at one time. It just happens to be that that one thing often is sex. <laughs> Every single woman I know worries about it. Look at my thighs, look at mine. Uh, and it's really funny because, um, and they're also looking at their faces all the time, all the time. Looking at a pair of jeans, look at the face, you know, and then the bum. But the expression, you know, trying to fit some sort of image of self that doesn't exist. It's crazy. I reckon women should worry more about being more intelligent and sounding more interesting and reading the paper than worry about, um, you know, fat asses. I think there is a lot of pressure, but 
I suspect it might come as much from other women as, as from anywhere else. Hi, Annette. Oh, you're looking good. That makeup looks fantastic. Oh, thank you. Yes, lovely. I think it's been very hard on women with all these images in magazines and newspapers, and they've all been retouched, and the women don't look like that when they get up in the mornings or most days. So we're trying to demystify it for women, aren't we, and, and make them realise that um, they can look like that too, but you don't have to look like that all the time um, to feel good about yourself. OK, that's nice. Isn't it? Lovely. Great. You end up getting dressed so fast in the morning you don't have time to put on your makeup or look good for anybody. You're just there to function as a mother and a taxi driver and, and everything else that goes along with everyday life. I mean, I go out at night occasionally and that's my chance to, to get dressed up, but I still don't get to do it very often. So you're looking too angelic there, Annette. We want angelic. Too angelic. We want a little bit of devil happening. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> I like that look. It oh, just cool. reminds you that you can be sensual and, and sexy and play at being another person. It's a whole different side of you that you can bring out. Beautiful. Very nice. 20 years ago, I mean, anything to do with sensuality or sexuality was so repressed. But now, it's they're going out there and doing things for themselves, but it also has a nice kickback for their husbands or boyfriends. I think he probably sees me in a different light as well. I've been having a bit more fun doing this, and it's certainly changed me. I don't understand people who obsess about knees or hips or something as far as I'm concerned if you don't like it change it if you or can't <laughs> if you can't change it change your attitude for the silver ferns like we train the body image we actually train for performance so a lot of us we have got and that's only because when you get out on court you got to jump around all over the way and all the plyometrics that we do and everything so if you put us in mini skirts we're not that attractive i like my body better after i gave birth than i did before yeah because i was really proud of what it had done you know i was a bit saggier in parts but um but i thought good job and um I suppose I felt more womanly. I've dieted as well, and I've, I've lost, say, the most I've ever lost would be about 20 k's. And I remember thinking, 20 k's lighter. I didn't, it was, there was no difference in, in me, except that I, my clothes fit better, or I could fit a smaller size. And when you stop and think about it that way, it's like... <laughs> on the outside, you can look a million dollars, and on the inside, feel like crap. <laughs> I don't think men realise that women do talk about sex. They don't actually talk about the lurid details, but they talk about how, how often you have sex. They say that men have thoughts about sex, I don't know, what, once every three minutes or something? Some magazines. There goes another one. <laughs> there goes another one. That's the thing. Men can only think about one thing at one time. It just happens to be that that one thing often is sex. <laughs> women think about sex all the time, too. You know, I, no, I'm sorry, I don't think it's one, one sided at all. I'm. Uh, you always, well, you don't. Everybody's going into it like that, leaping to bed. All oh, right, yes, how do you do? You know, it's all back to front. <laughs> so the how wrong values do? come first. Do you know what I mean? Do you think that's what happens? Yes, I do. I think we forget the sexual revolution we've come from. Virginity was just the norm. In our parents' age, it was kind of expected and it didn't, well, it was just the norm of society. And there were lots of exceptions. I think there were probably mainly exceptions, but it was now virginity is an anomaly. It's like a circus act. You Women assume that men come in for um, for the sexual um, um, innuendo or, or whatever. I think women assume that that's why men go into a lingerie shop and I think that's unfair because it's not always so. If they do, they might, might be wanting a bit of fun and, and that's fine, but I, it's, it's the women that assume that men come in here for only one reason. Over here we've got um, some baby doll negligees, um, which, which are a very good seller. Uh, moving on to the French maid. And um, right around the corner here, we've got some PVC mistresses generally buy. But um, 
what 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 you'll find is men coming in buying a lot of the softer sort of lingerie for their wives or girlfriends and um the girls tend to come and buy this sort of stuff for themselves people think that men like to buy black all the time but i find that men prefer to buy white um uh and often it's it's not the smallest piece of lingerie that a man will like um it might be something um like a french knicker which is quite elaborate there was no contraception so fear and and innocence kept us on the straight path childbirth is the best contraception ever having a child you know after you've had a baby and the, and the, the um what do you call obstetrician comes in and says you know contra yeah and what about contraception and you you know oh, it's okay i'm never going to have sex again for the rest of my life <laughs> sometimes you just prefer a cup of tea frankly with the married i think it depends what stage of um the marriage they're at um i mean if they're having fun and life's great and there's no children um they're quite daring and adventurous with what they choose you get home you've had a hard day uh, your partner's at home he's cooked a nice meal you know those sort of things and that thing for me doesn't take much, you know, that's nicer for me than maybe having a romp in a bed, you know, the things where you just get in, you know, how's your uncle, Bob, you know, whatever, and you're out. Women often go through a period of being uncomfortable with themselves and uncomfortable with life and tired. They can't be bothered um, with um with fun things or trying something they're you know they're stressed and i think the men sense this or that they certainly will become aware and they usually then then those married men would buy something more in the comfort area or something that she, they know she really wants and that i might find more affectionate and more loving and more caring than sex but in saying that you know sex is a good thing too so they have more yeah <laughs> I was very naive. I really didn't know anything, and my mother didn't tell me anything. And, uh... You didn't tell me anything either. Yes, but today you all learn it, don't you? You had classes at school and so on. No, we didn't. Yes, you did. Oh, that's right. You went, well, well but then you it was did. all... It was just this video with this great big picture that could have been anything and they go this is the woman's love canal and all this sort of rubbish it was just ridiculous and i remember you sitting there all uncomfortable with jackie's mother my mum gave my sister and i the tampon talk once and we had no idea what she was going on about and we just went mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and she said the end do you understand and i went yep yeah. Well, I think periods no were explained to me when I was about 10. I had absolutely no idea what was that, what that was about. It frightened me, I think, a little bit. I thought I was dying. I thought I'd, cause I'd eaten plums the night before, these dark Doris plums, and I thought that they were just plums. I thought, oh, my God, I'm never eating those again. The women don't think about the sex bit all the time, but they, I think they're very conscious of men, attractive to men. I think subconsciously, Probably women do think about sex, not in that, you know, I want it or whatever, but they think about, um, you know, how, in what way they can use it, maybe subconsciously. When women use the, her femininity, and, you know, I mean, when I'm not talking about tits in the face, I'm not talking about things, it's not about cleavage, but charm is the twinkle of the eye and the kindness. It'll win every time, and women use that. But women are manipulative creatures. I still, just people of my age, for God's sake, normal, sensible women, when someone hoves into view who's a man who's quite attractive, they suddenly go all... ...was dilate and they, they start talking softer and listening. They do a lot more listening when a man's around. I don't really feel like wearing pants. No, I think it's fit. And I think a plain back top is just out of the question. <laughs> Maybe. I don't feel like wearing something brown. Some women will dress for men, but you can usually tell the women are dressing for men. It's so funny how people always think that you're getting sort of dressed up to... To impress people, Impress yeah. the opposite sex, and yeah. it's so not like that. No. So what do you think about the red? Mm. Can I say it with the fair thing? With the stole. Mm. If you're a reasonably good-looking young woman, then you're okay. 
regardless of whether you've got education or anything like that. Even in New Zealand, it's still like that, though. I think that you should wear this because you're wearing all red. I love the piece of silk Italian shoe. I think you're more likely to sort of um, cash in on your, like on your physical assets if you're a woman than if you're a man. They Which are. is ridiculous, but we'll play on it for now. <laughs> <laughs> Life is easier for them. Life is easier. So if any woman can or wants to um, use the way they look or anything like all the attitude or yeah. what they're wearing to, to get them somewhere or to achieve something, then I think that's great. But just don't ask them their political opinion. I honestly uh, believe yeah. women are the most critical audience. They don't are. you think? Because There's if you walk into a room... We've gone out and we've had the, the most awful bitch. look. Look! Yeah, I know. Mother it's crazy, woman. Yeah. They come out particularly noticeable at those sort of Christmas functions, the vixen, who hate it. And, you know, why do I hate this? This is her business, you know what I mean? And, and then, but the other half of you is, is sort of thinking, what is it? Tell what it is. I reckon it's like, hang on a moment. And so I've worked this hard. <laughs> You do feel the biological clock ticking away. Yeah, I've got it. <laughs> when you come to my age, there's an incredible pressure to have children. Like, as everybody around you is doing it, and like the last minute sort of people going, well, I'm 36, I'm 38, you know, I'm going to do it now. And they just go off and have these kids, and everyone's going, are you going to do it? Are you going to do it? Are you going to do it? They're all asking you as well. Mm. So there is that incredible pressure. And you do feel the biological clock ticking away. Yeah, I've got it on snooze. <laughs> We bloom, we look fabulous, we get bigger if we've never had them before and it's just absolutely wonderful and everybody compliments us. Oh, then there's a point, sort of six to eight months, where we think, I'm never ever going to be a woman again. My God, do you really want it? You yeah, go on. Tell me well, how I may just suffer. And well, that was just the beginning. Well, are you going to let me? Yeah, go on. Personally speaking, I found the act of giving birth tumultuously awful combined with the with the wondrousness of having this this glorious package at the end of it i was then three days and three nights unable they wouldn't let me eat i sucked ice i had the pains every 20 minutes which they would think you know regulate them oh yes and then at night they'd let me sleep ready to go through it all again the next day That's the best advice somebody gave to me they said jennifer it hurts no it Okay. And I remember thinking, <laughs> so all I could think of was that pain. Unbelievable. Really, you'd think they would have done something about it by now. It was dreadful. The whole thing was dreadful. They would never leave women three days now. No. And nothing to eat, just sucking ice. I don't know what that was all about. I said to Barbara, if she decided to have children in between the Olympics, I'm not looking after it. <laughs> because her role as a mother is to be there for her children. I thought all I ever wanted to be was a mother for the rest of my life, and I will be a mother for the rest of my life, but I thought that I would be happy doing that 24 hours a day, every day, but the reality is... I feel happy doing this every day, I go to work every day. <laughs> No, but I think after Jamie was born, it was a really tough year. Um, you don't want to be a mother. <laughs> I do want to be a mother, Frida. <laughs> you work two days a week, nine till three, and half the time one of you is home. The office is downstairs. You're always down there anyway, so I never get anything done. The only thing you get respected for is your career. If you become a mother, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, whoopty shit. We sort of incredibly judgmental both ways. So either if you're just a mother, there's no value to that, and if you're a working mother, or you're not being a proper parent. Mm. It doesn't matter whether you're juggling your career and children, as long as children are coming first in your equations of how and, you're and managing they, your life. And they're happy. They're happy and mm. contented, and mm. however you manage it, I don't know. 
women particularly who are working get complaints from their partners this is true because I talk about it with my girlfriends like oh they keep saying stop planning everything can't we just see what happens in life why do you, what about spontaneity but because you, you've got so much to fill and you do tend to diary you know everything is diaried and um, and you you do and you walk around you know shouting orders at people because you know you've got all this, this stuff to get done or is it just me? <laughs> they're always busy and have never got time to do anything and they're always saying things like, so busy, I'm so tired, didn't get any sleep, um, I'm working 400 times, you know, it's like, yeah, okay, but you choose to do that. So if you want to do that, fine. If you don't want to do that, then drop something. There's a risk in it, the superwoman syndrome issue. But y y you can juggle. It's a matter of choice. And if you're really well organised and, and are tuned in to what other people need as well, you can pull it off. This company's built up, built enough, and we're, and we're very busy, and it's building up, and I, and I love it, and I love the flying. But in reality, if I could um, spend my time at home making chutney and playing with my baby and using my husband's credit card to go shopping, I'd rather be doing that. Ruin really. Well, I've got my office at home, so in some ways that's really difficult because you can, as you can see, there's constant interruptions. But it's also great for me knowing, and for them knowing, that I'm right on hand, you know, if there's anything wrong, whatever. And I can go up and periodically see them and, and do whatever. And, and also for Pam, my partner, you know, if our children are sick, there's a home that they can come to and we're here. Um, so, you know, the advantages, because of the age of my children, it's really important that they're, that they're close by. I don't think a woman's place is that in rebellion of her mother decided to be the woman in the home and not earn a penny of her own money, but that did her no good. She was extremely unhappy being power. Women are forever asking how advice on how to mix, you know, family life and, and being married with a professional life. I've never heard them ask for advice of how to actually combine marriage and professional life. People used to say, you know, who's looking after your children? And I'm sure they never asked my male colleagues that same question. When I look back, if I had my children again, there are so many things I'd do differently. I would be there more, I would have been there more often at three o'clock when they came home from school. I didn't realise how important that was. I think we're going to see the, the repercussions further down the track, and that's in no way critical of women who have to go out to work. I think that that is um, part of our growth experience, but you wonder about the the sense of security that children have. As a working mother, you're supposed to be sort of saying, look, it's fine, the kids are happy, everyone's happy, we all win, it's good for them. It, you know, and you sort of find yourself saying that, and underneath it all, you're still thinking, have I done the right thing? If there's something going wrong in the kids' lives, it, 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 I can still feel it undermine um, my confidence and ability. I mean, you'd never, you'd never know, but I know. Come on, into school, in, into the car, come on. Well, just take your blanket, we'll get the drink and milk when you come home. There's your blanket. Take your blanket up. I see motherhood as, you know, throwing the baby in the car and going off and doing a bit of work and doing a few appointments and coming home and, you know, totally unrealistic. I just see a way that it's worked in with work. I'll get it in a minute, okay? most natural thing in the world, you know, it's not that difficult, surely. <laughs> of course, we haven't had kids. Because <laughs> when I have my kids, I've been so able to It's very easy for us to say <laughs> how easy it is to bring... Couldn't bear it. She's so lovely. boring. We're all adventurers, because that's... I mean, New Zealanders, immigrants, we're all adventurers. There's not one weak woman in my family. Yeah, not one. My mother, my grandmother, my grand aunts, my great grandparents, you know, even though I didn't know them, very, very strong willed. And the, the family stories that came through were always about the women. New Zealand women are exceptional, I think, because they're, they're civilised and yet hardy at the same time. My mother 
made everything that we ate. Cooked, baked, made the tomato sauce, made the peanut butter, bottled, pickled. They spent so much time on food. I do remember throwing the cupboards open uh, as a young wife uh, when I had succeeded in doing what everyone else did and um, stored the preserves for the year. Thank heavens, freeze me from it about two years later. Yeah, well, I wouldn't have holes in that. No, no, but is that all right for competition? Oh. I don't know, but I think young ones now are more inclined to go and buy something out of the shop. Um, to me, it's an art that we should keep going. I mean, it, it's quite nice to be able to teach our daughters how to, how to bake and know that they can do it. And there's definitely no baking in the tins. <laughs> and uh, yeah, whoever's in first cooks tea. I actually think that you should know how to cook and so in that because my mother does. I'm a good baker. I haven't done it for several years. I, um, my mother was good at cooking and used to burn the baking and I, sorry mum, and she did actually get stressed and burn the baking sometimes. But um, so I used to do the baking and I like baking because it, it's one thing that has to be finished at a time, not three things. I would actually quite like to do the things like baking on a Saturday, um, like I remember my mother doing, but I don't because I'm too tired, so I just buy biscuits instead. <laughs> but I actually would, there's something in me that, oh, if only I could squeeze that in, you know. Not that I know how to. <laughs> you were talking about the fine women of the future. Well, we professional women, we are quite capable too. So we have the bacon egg pie and the chocolate cake. And we have a jar of the chutney. I'm well known for my Tamarillo chutney, you see. Housework meant much more, and cleaning out the grates and scrubbing this and scrubbing that. Because we've had these options now, I mean, who'd want to go back? <laughs> you know? Like, even if it was, this is why I say I want to be a rich housewife, not just a housewife. Because if I was just sitting at home, I wouldn't do my own housework, because I had find absolutely no enjoyment whatsoever with mopping the floor. I actually like housework. If it's if I've got time to do it, I love pumping up cushions and making something look aesthetically pleasing. Boy Friday and all that kind of stuff. So I don't, you know, I work too hard. I don't need and uh, be doing the dishes. That's that's the cleanest job. I'm sure you don't need someone to come in. It's just more money you're rich. But if you're poor like me, well then I'd rather do it myself. I couldn't do what I do without that support. I know I also couldn't have the quality of time uh, with the children. Is that crochet? Crochet together. Crochet together. Yes. Yes. Plenty of wear in it. All good, all good wool in, in that. So, so you could use the double knitting or it's double knitting. Couldn't bear it. She's so done. boring. Knitting yes. on and on and sewing I'd quite like to be able to do but um, I haven't got time to learn. I've got other things I've got to be doing, you know. She's good at art, though, you see. She would sit and draw and paint and things. We had to. And, and it was a, a pleasure to knit and sew. I made everything. <laughs> Overcoats, everything. Proud of it. Darning the socks. <laughs> Forget about it. Keep yourself looking beautiful. And then the husband was afraid somebody else was get, may steal her. <laughs> When my mother and father, he said to her, um, promise me, Joe, you know, one thing, after we're married, um, never stop wearing lipstick. And my mother took it to heart, and she always went to bed with lipstick on, and in fact had the um, lipstick under the pillow at night. I don't even wear lipstick. <laughs> Do you own anything? <laughs> I was probably an old tube some, somewhere in the back drawer, but oh, no, very rarely lipstick. Women tend to tend to want something very natural. They, the last thing they want to do is to look made up. Um, and women just feel that, that little bit more attractive with a bit of makeup. If it's maybe um, accentuating the eyes or maybe the lips, it just makes them feel a lot better about themselves, gives them a lot more self-confidence. 
it, it all boils down to wanting to look attractive, whether it's to look attractive to men or other women. I mean, women always comment on if a woman is looking very, very attractive. It's funny that men never do that. Men will never say, oh, Steve's looking very, very good this evening. But um, a lot of women will actually say, oh, Fiona, you look beautiful this evening. In the 60s, 70s and 80s were all about loads of makeup all the time. And listen, if it's wearing off, you've got to grab the mirror and replace it. it we don't think about that now. We just don't. We don't. We're more concerned with whether our cell phones, the batteries were running out, than whether we've got fresh lipstick on. If a woman really wants to take um, the best care of her skin and protect against premature ageing, she's going to need soothing eye makeup remover first and foremost. Then she's going to need a cleanser of some sort, maybe special cleansing gel, essential cleansing solution, dermal clay cleanser or anti-back skin wash, for example, multi-active toner. She's going to need eye care, total eye care with an SPF 15, maybe intensive eye repair for the um, evening. A whole makeup's, you know, it's fantastic. And you can wear too much of it. But it's a tool, it's like I see makeup as a tool that, and I know it can make me look, make me feel more confident and, and make me look fantastic. But I don't want to have to have it. We also have our booster range. It may well be that she's using a skin a active firming booster. Those are twice a day with your day cream. But the renewal booster or a clearing booster. Makes me a bit bummed out that um, so much revolves around it. I'd love to have a hair removal system that when you removed it, it stayed gone. So if they can come, someone can do something like that, that would be fantastic. That, hours of or yeah, that bikini line thing at the middle of summer is just the pits. Ouch. <laughs> How far down will things go? <laughs> will things go? Introducing a company as an active partner to more than four. Shopping. It's an addiction. Men shop because they you know, have a hole in pants, must buy new pants. Women shop for entertainment. Oh, I don't need to shop for entertainment. I go entertainment in front of my house. In my house. My husband's there, and the TV's there, the radio's there, and the children are there. That's all the entertainment you need. At my job, I hated going to work, and I used to spend a lot of money on stuff that I didn't even need um, because I wasn't happy. And then as soon as I stopped doing that job, I, my shopping got cut right in half. Because your big salary deal. got cut? Well, yeah, apart from that. Somebody stopped me in a shop in New York and said, I went to a super, uh, department store there and said, is there a children's department you'll have to buy for yourself today? And I went, <laughs> and I went... I must admit, actually, that if I buy clothes myself, there's a feeling of, I definitely do this. Well, I, I bloody well deserve it. I've worked hard. I can justify every purchase I've ever made. You don't need to go shopping because you borrow my clothes, that's all right. It's when the credit card bills come in, that's when the thrill really is. A lot of husbands that come in and see their wives having their hair coloured freak out at the thought of all of this going on. They have no idea. They can't understand why it takes, you know, a few hours. But, um, it, and they don't always compliment their wives, which is a lot of things that I hear from, from the women that we colour, is that they go home and their husbands don't say anything. The attention thing is big. Having that one-on-one -on -one attention for at least two hours is a big deal. You know, you haven't got any interruptions, you've just got this. I mean, women will talk to us about all sorts of things which I don't think their husbands would definitely, you know, wouldn't necessarily approve of. I mean, while we're doing this, we're listening to everything that's going on, so people find that they can be very open with that. They want to be able to relax totally, let you take control, cater to every want as far as, you know, they want the full indulgence. 
full relaxation. It's really that full pampering thing. The amount of men that's... Me, I met you 25 years ago. You were beautiful. As if in some way I've let them down, and I think, how extremely rude. And what can one say to that? Well, you had more hair. More interesting. Grow old gracefully. Yeah. Grow old gracefully. Why not? Mm. Absolutely. There's, there's nothing worse than an older woman who's trying to look very young, and we see a few of them around, mm. don't we? Mm. To have a facelift, they cut you here, about there, and go right down there, down your earlobe, and right at the back, and under your hairline at the back. I had my first facelift 15 years ago, and I wasn't very happy with that one. So I went to the second surgeon, and he done another one. Then I got very addicted to it. So I had my eyes done, lifted, another nose. I had three noses all together. I had, an eye, as I said, an eye lift and a brow lift. And I had a, no lip, hardly at all, on my top lip. So I had it stitched back, plus the, my bottom one. And um, the thing that is, I've only got my skin, that is my only thing that I have. Just the idea of cosmetic surgery and things like that, that people actually go and do those things is abhorrent. When I do have, uh, when I entertain the possibility, I don't have a great deal of respect, myself, uh, respect for myself by entertaining, you know, for entertaining it. I I'd don't go know. for the lot if I could. Would you? Well, <laughs> once upon a time I would have, yeah. Do it again. But you need money. No, I'm not going to show how much better I'd look. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It is just one step removed from colouring your hair. Now, the only reason I haven't coloured my hair is I haven't had time, right? Because I've got my grey showing through. But it is, when you think about it, why do you colour your hair? There is a sh Yeah, but... To, you know, this is this is the body, this is the face, this is what we were born with and we're carrying through. At least give it some um, as it's supposed to, not to radically changing it. My daughter's 44 today and um, she's got, she says she's 50 and she's got more wrinkles than I have now. And I think she, when she's done also. Sometimes I look at myself in the mirror and I think, gosh, What's gonna? What's? How far down will things go? <laughs> will things go? I don't know how women are ever gonna be taken seriously. Sometimes when we've still got women who put silicon stuff into their breasts, it's just a big waste of money. If, well, you should just be happy with what you're given. I mean, everyone grows old. It doesn't matter if you go. you just just because you're older than some other ladies. But if your husband doesn't love you for who you are and what you look like, well then he's no good for you. But I haven't had any operations since for four years. So um, lines are coming up again and I need to um, look into my face again and see what I can do to keep going. Look another ten years younger. Just for myself, nobody else. Somewhere in the back of my mind, I, this is true, I have stored this picture of that gorgeous model, Lauren Hutton, that old Revlon model, and somewhere in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, well, when I get there, I mean, look, she looks fantastic. She's obviously got it together and she's been through menopause, so I'll just, just read her book. <laughs> I'll just do whatever she did. <laughs> I think your beauty secret is kindness. Oh, really? Yes. She's very kind and very um, outgoing and you really care about people. And I think that um, your generosity makes you beautiful. Oh, I say. I do. Put it in writing. You're all right. Goodness. Never said anything like that before. Well, I believe it. Oh. This is like men not saying they love you. You want to say that sort of thing more often. <laughs> the 
handbag. This is the easy way of living. Two handbags. One is a small little handbag. For the busy woman of today, I find a large practical <laughs> carry set. <laughs> Velcro. As well as my handbag, I have a toolbox, which I keep in my car as a Christmas present for my dad. What do you have in your handbag? Evening primrose oil, Nurofen, hay fever tablets. Eye drops, lipsticks, a couple of different colours. Pinch nose pliers. Wrench. Oh, material samples. I told you should have material samples <laughs> anyway. A screwdriver for sunglasses. The pen. I mean, not everybody. They're not diamonds, by the way, but it's a good look, isn't it? <laughs> Take measure. Nine teeth, ten points saw. Toothbrush. Ubiquitous. I have those. Ten packs. I have those. Knickers. Wipe all those out. Contraception pills because you never know when you're going to forget in the morning and need to take yeah. it later that day. And there's some bold bits of paper. That's fully charged. There's enough in here to keep us going for a few days. Oh. I don't know how men survive without handbags. Where do you keep all this stuff? This program was made with the help of your broadcasting fee, so you can see more of New Zealand on...